Hey kiddos, tonight we're going to talk a little bit about BCA tables. These are a really useful tool for us um, in stoichiometry, particularly when we're calculating things with limiting reactants. So first off, what is a BCA table? And essentially what it is, is as with any sort of table, it's essentially a way to organize some information or organize some data for us. Why it's useful to us is because it's really going to help us to calculate some uh, stoichiometry problems, especially limiting reactant ones, and it's going to allow us to do a whole bunch of different things um, all at one time instead of having to do multiple, like a whole bunch of different steps or a whole bunch of like almost separate problems. We can do everything at once. So it's called a BCA table because it stands for before the reaction occurs. Okay, so like at the beginning, what is the change during the reaction? Okay. And then what is what do we have left at the end of the reaction? So after the reaction has gone to completion, what do we have left at the end? And so if we had like a simple reaction, like our Haber process here that we're going to use in our example problem, we've got two reactants here. We've got one product. And we would list in what we had at the beginning, probably zero of the product. And then we would calculate what the change was. And then we would see how much we would have afterwards. Um, you might be thinking that this we would do this anyway if we were doing a stoichiometry problem, but I think you'll see that the layout here is really useful and allows you to do many things at once. So I think the best way to see this is just to jump in and see what one of these problems looks like. So in our problem, we're going to work a problem with this really common reaction. You've probably used it a hundred times in chemistry classes. Um, and so our reaction is the Haber process. We're going to take diatomic nitrogen. We're going to combine that with diatomic hydrogen to get ammonia okay really important historical reaction you should really look that stuff up um, Haber is one of those examples of someone who was terrible and who also did a ton of good for the world too so historically speaking and chemically speaking super interesting guy anyway total total side word there um, so in our problem we're going to say that we have 1.5 moles of nitrogen and 5.75 moles of hydrogen to start with now this is really important because um, Every time you use a BCA table, you need to write everything down in terms of moles. We're going to see later on in your career, you'll see that that's going to be different, that we will not write everything down in moles. But I'm going to write this one down in terms of moles. Every time you do a BCA table, everything should be in moles. So we initially have 1.95 moles of nitrogen, 5.75 moles of hydrogen, and we have zero moles of the product. That's what we're trying to get to is the product. Now you might be saying, are we always going to have zero moles of the product? For us in Chem 1, probably. Okay, there might be cases um, where you don't, but generally speaking, we're always going to have um, zero product at this level of chemistry that we're talking about here. So here comes the slightly more complicated part. So this is the part where we would do a traditional limiting reactive thing, where we would say, okay, which one of these things am I going to run out of first? So I've got a lot less nitrogen. It seems like I would run out of that first, since I have a lot more hydrogen here. Um, but remember that the only way that we can really tell that is by doing a quick mole ratio. Okay, so I'm going to do that. I'm just going to write that out. I've got 1.95 moles of nitrogen. All right, so what we've got there is we've got, and that remember that that's nitrogen, N2. So we want to cancel moles of nitrogen. I'm going to put that on the bottom, one mole, three moles of hydrogen, and when we multiply that out, what we're going to get for our final answer there is we're going to get 5.85 moles of H2. Now remember that what that would actually mean is that to fully react with each other, in other words, to completely cancel out both of those things, I would need to, I would have 1.95 moles of nitrogen. I would need 5.85 moles of hydrogen to make that work. So if I subtracted my 1.95 moles of nitrogen to completely cancel it out, that means that I would have to subtract 5.85 moles of hydrogen. And that very plainly isn't going to work out because if I subtract 5.75 minus 5.85, I'm going to get negative 0.1, and I can't get negative values. Okay, you can't have a negative amount of product left at the end. The least you can have is zero. Now, what does that tell us immediately? Well, just like it would have normally for a limiting reactant problem, that would have told me that nitrogen is not my limiting reactant, that hydrogen is the limiting reactant. So that's sort of solved like in a normal problem, okay, a normal limiting reactant problem. But let me show you how this gets a lot easier here, okay? So now that I know that hydrogen is my limiting reactant, I'm going to start with that instead. So 5.75 
moles of hydrogen. Now remember the whole point of a limiting reactant is that you're going to completely consume it, right? It's the thing that you run out of. So that means I already know that I'm going to lose all 5.75 moles of hydrogen, which means that I'm going to be left with zero moles of hydrogen. So the question is then, how much nitrogen do I lose? Do I lose 5.75? Well, obviously not, because they're in a 3 to 1 ratio. And so I've got to do that little bit of math, sort of the inverse of what we just did, to figure out how much nitrogen we're going to use. Okay, so in our case, if we do this little bit of math here, we're going to get 1.92, roughly, moles of nitrogen. Okay, so we're going to come over here. Now what you can see there is that that means that we're losing almost all of the nitrogen, but not quite. Okay, that means that at the end we're going to be left with 0 .03, 0 0.03 moles of nitrogen at the end. Okay, now that's important for us because our second question asked us how much of the excess reagent was left over. Okay, and again, we could have calculated that with a normal stoichiometry problem, but now everything's in this nice organized fashion. I know that I ran out of hydrogen. That's my limiting reactant. Okay, I know that I have this much of N2 left, so I can answer that question now. So let's go ahead and put that answer there. So we know that we have 0.03 and really, if we're doing sig figs right, we'd have three zero zero. It's actually probably a little bit different than that, but close enough moles of nitrogen. Okay, so that's how much excess is left. And then the last question asks how many grams of ammonia are produced. Well, we already are sort of set up for that. Okay, we already know that we've lost these things and that we could figure out how much of this do we add. So we lost the reactants. They're getting consumed in the process of the reaction happening, and we're going to gain product. So the question is, how much product do we gain? Well, again, that's a real simple mole ratio calculation. Again, I'm going to go back and use my initial 5.7 moles of hydrogen because that's the limiting reactant. And any time you're doing stoichiometry, you should be trying to use the limiting reactant. If you're not, then something's going to go wrong. So three moles of hydrogen. And then what's different here is that now what we have is two moles of ammonia on the top. So two moles of NH3, and we're going to do that little bit of math there, and that's going to tell us how many moles of ammonia get produced, which happens to be 3.83 moles of ammonia. Actually, I don't need that moles at the end. Let's just get rid of that, because everything on the BCA table is in moles. Okay, so that's great. That's not what the final question asked us, right? So we've got 3.83 moles of ammonia, but what it actually asked us was how many grams of ammonia? Well, no problem. We are well versed in how all this works, so we're going to calculate the molar mass. It's 17 grams of ammonia in one mole. We calculate that out, and we get, let me look on my paper here, we get 65.1 grams of ammonia. Now, the beauty here of what we have done is yes, we've still had to do basically all the same math that we would do if we did a normal limiting reactor problem, but now everything is in this nice table. Everything is really easy to find. Boom, zero, that's the limiting reactant, hydrogen. Excess, I know how much of it I have. I know how many moles of the product I have at the end as well, which means that by a simple mole ratio, I can get right to grams if that's what I'm looking for, okay? So that sort of so shows us some of the beauty of like the, just the organizational power of a BCA table. So let's talk real quick then about what does the BCA table actually help us to be able to do. So why is this really useful? Okay, so several things here are going to make it really useful for us. So first off, it's going to be real easy to spot what the limiting reactant is. We do a little bit of mole ratio work, boom, the thing that's zero on the table is going to give us a limiting reactant. It's also going to tell us the mole amounts of everything at the end, both reactants and products. Now, in the reaction that we did, we only had three things involved, but sometimes you've got like three different products and two or three different reactants. And so being able to have everything all set up in a table together is going to be much easier. It's going to help us to learn that all roads go through moles. You know how the, the old saying was that all roads lead to Rome? Well, in chemistry, all roads lead through moles. And so this doing everything in a BCA table helps to remind us, okay, that anytime we're doing any sort of stoichiometric work, but particularly limiting reactants, 
we need to make sure that we're doing everything in moles. We're going to be working with mole ratios from the balanced equations, so we always need to be in moles. Okay, and finally, it's going to help to prepare us for ice tables later on. Um, when you get into some higher level chemistry and you start to do equilibrium stuff, you're going to need some ice tables to be able to do that. And a lot of experience with BCA tables would just make that so much easier for you. So I really encourage you to, uh, when you can, use BCA tables to solve your limiting reactor problems. All right, I hope that was understandable to everyone, and I hope that that was really useful and helpful to you.